Our first speaker is Dr. Jiang Rogers, Senior Advisor and Economist of the Federal Reserve Board. And our second speaker is Dr. Wen Ni Ni, Senior Economic Advisor and Economist at the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia. Now let's get the session started. Okay, so um, effect of the China Connect. Uh, my two co-authors are here from Shanghai, uh, Chang and, and Sili over there, uh, assistant professors at Fudan University. And then uh, me, Wo uh, Shi Fudan Lao Shi, 2018. Wo de Tai Tai Shi Zhai Shanghai Chusheng, 2018. <laughs> so, Wo Hui Shu Idian Zhongwen, Idian. <laughs> so in this, in this paper, we study uh, what was a very important capital account liberalization in China in the mid-2010s. And we think that this particular episode's lessons learned uh, from this episode have you know, kind of more general effects on literature as on capital controls and independence of monetary policy and spillovers of external shock. So, so even though it's kind of one specific episode, a, an important one that we study, we think the lessons are broader than that. So let me give you an overview. The, 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 the paper actually has a lot of results. Uh, it's close to being ready for, uh, to be submitted for publication. Let me just interrupt myself in saying that uh, uh, unfortunately, we are headed to a conference in Seattle and have to get out to Dulles Airport. Uh, and you, know, you know what a nightmare that can be. So we'll have to miss the very end of the conference. But, uh, and, and I'm saddened by that because it, it's a super interesting conference. And uh, thanks especially to Chow for, for invi inviting me uh, for, for that. But in any case, there's, there's lots of results in the paper. We're pretty close to uh, the point where we're ready to submit it for publication. But I'll try to not be too detailed in all of this, uh, against my nature, uh, not being too detailed in all of this, kind of give you some of the highlights. So first, well, what is the China Connect? Well, what was the China Connect? Again, a very important equity market liberalization started uh, the, you know, linking mainland Chinese stock markets with the stock market in Hong Kong. It was begun in Shanghai, so the Shanghai Hong Kong Connect was announced in April 2014, implemented a few months later, and then was extended to the Shenzhen Exchange uh, in, in 2016. And, and what the, the Connect does is to allow investors in mainland China and in Hong Kong, including non-Chinese, non right? So this is in a way, a way that Westerners can get into the mainland Chinese equity markets. It allows those investors to trade eligible stocks listed on the other market. So it was a true connect of the Shanghai, Shenzhen, and uh, Hong Kong markets. Transactions are cleared through the exchange in the home market. There are some limitations here. Uh, there's some aggregate quotas imposed on daily uh, transactions, etc. But this was a, you know, a big liberalization of the mainland Chinese equity markets that, looking at the final bullet here, importantly, for the purpose of econometric identification anyway, okay, this liberalization came about at a time when the overall capital controls policy in China remained in place. So, so at, at a kind of macro or national level, this overall capital controls policy in China was, was unchanged, while the Connect allowed certain firms, but not all firms, okay, on the Sh Shanghai and Shenzhen exchanges to be co-listed in, in Hong Kong. So, th so that's particularly nice, as I was saying, for purposes of econometric identification. So what, what do we do? We, we basically have two findings in this paper. It's pretty simple. Either it's loaded with tables and all that stuff's robustness checks that you have to do to get papers published, of course. There's really two, two, two results here, and that's, that's what I want you to uh, just to kind of, kind of focus on. So lo looking at the first bullet here, is Chinese corporate investment, so we mean physical investment, capital expenditures, Okay. on the part of Chinese firms influenced by external shocks, okay. and is it 
is that investment differentially affected depending on whether that firm is included in the connect or not? And the answers are yes and yes. Okay, so, so, so that's the, the first question. The external shock we look at is a US monetary policy shock. I'm a, I'm a Fed guy. We were all getting together. Hey, I, I, got, I got a shock for, for you guys uh, sitting there at, uh, at Fon High. Uh, that uh, lovely day he's there. I miss Shanghai very much. Uh, and we kind of relate this to the vast literature on capital controls. That's what capital controls are all about. Governments attempting to sort of, you know, minimize the effects of external shocks on the domestic economy, you know, somehow. Okay, so, so we, we relate that first finding to this vast literature on uh, capital controls and global financial cycles, the great work that Helene Ray has done, for example. And re recall that in that literature on global financial cycles, the, the culprit's the Fed, right? It, it's all, all Fed monetary policy. That's, that's the key driver of the global financial cycle, according to Helene's work. And, and Jay has got to be an expert in all, all this, too. Go talk to Jay if. Uh, if, uh, if you need to about all this, this literature. And, and so, so that's a logical external shock for us to study. It's not just that I'm a Fed guy, as I joked about. Uh, it, it's really, this is seen to be the driver of the global financial cycle. Okay, so that, that, that's, that's result number one. But, you know, we, we asked ourselves, well, you know, that's kind of a, 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 a bad thing, what, what one might think, that, well, you know, now Chinese firms, uh, upon, uh, inclusion in the connect, Chinese firms have their investment expenditures more sensitive to U.S. monetary policy shocks. S seems to be kind of a, a, a bad thing, right? There's some loss of control over the, their own destiny, if you will, and complicates things for Chinese monetary policy authorities. But if that were the only effect of the connect, presumably we would see Chinese firms lobbying to stay out of it or behaving in such a way that, that like, we, we don't want to be in the connect. And we don't observe that behavior. So there must be other effects of the connect. And we document those in the second part of the paper. So, so those are the two results. That, that on the one hand, Chinese firms' investment expenditures are more sensitive to US monetary policy shocks upon inclusion in the connect. That sensitivity works in the direction of contractionary U.S. monetary policy shocks spill over more negatively to Chinese firms' investment on the part of those firms included in the Connect relative to those outside of the Connect, where while those other effects of the Connect are documented right here, these sort of more positive ones, we find that firms, for example, uh, uh, included in the Connect have lower financing costs higher return on equity, higher return on assets. Uh, there's an equity price revaluation upon inclusion in, in the connect. And, and, you know, and that's it. So that, 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 that's the paper. You know, econometrically, as I've hopefully described already, it's a very nice, this, this China connect uh, policy is a very nice natural experiment to do uh, the, the differences in differences uh, you know, kind of apply a diff, diff and diff econometric approach to studying the effect of some particular shock, <clears throat> the connect shock and the, and the uh, associated uh, uh, effect of U.S. monetary policy on firms' uh, investment expenditures, again, differentially depending on whether that firm is in the connect or not. We exploit the, the vast uh, heterogeneity in the cross-section of firms to say some things about, well, which, which types of firms are more affected by uh, US monetary policy shocks in, 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 uh, after inclusion in the connect uh, with a, a financial constraints type of story there. Mentioned this kind of already, the, the, the first two certainly, we relate this, these findings kind of more, more generally uh, to this literature on global financial cycles and capital controls. There's a literature looking at corporate investment and, and, and macroeconomic or global uncertainty. I'll, I'll, skip, over, I'll skip over that. So, so once again, the three, three hypotheses, really just two. There's kind of a middle one in there. Uh, hypothesis one, firms included in the Connect are going to be more sensitive to external shocks after inclusion. Okay, That external shock is a U.S. monetary policy shock. 
So it's really this beta 3, okay, and the, the diff and diff regression equation that we're going to rely on a lot. I'm just going to show you a bunch of tables, more or less, from here on in. It's really this beta 3 coefficient. This is what we expect to see with, from hypothesis 1, a negative and significant coefficient on the interaction term between U.S. monetary policy shocks and the connect dummy. That's a 0, 1 dummy as to whether at any quarter in the sample the firm was in the connect or, or, or not in the, in the connect. Okay? We'll also be interested in beta 1 and beta 2 a little bit, and, I, and I'll point those out to you too. So, you know, you know what is the effect of, of, of being in the connect on some outcome variable y. Okay, so most of the tables that I'll show you, most, most of the regression results, y will be physical investments, so capital expenditures. But in the second part of the paper, showing result two, which is hypothesis three, uh, y will be things like return on equity, uh, return on assets, cash holdings, financing costs. So we'll document all of those results, again, that part two of the paper, by changing around the, the left-hand side variable. Okay. So let's just, uh, let's just get to that. Uh, there's a lot of vast literature on U.S. monetary, identifying U.S. monetary policy shocks. Right? Careers have been made uh, mm -hmm. on this. I, I do some of it myself. So I told these guys, hey, I got, a, I got a shot. I even have a couple more for you from, uh, from other papers. So I don't want to get into details of that. We could spend literally the rest of the day talking about that literature. I only want to point out one thing to you just so that when you look at the tables, you won't be too confused. There are a couple of different ways from using high frequency identification tools for estimating the U.S. monetary policy shock. So we're looking at movements in bond futures prices in narrow windows around FOMC announcements in order to cleanly identify the U.S. monetary policy shock. The use of short windows kind of alleviate some endogeneity concerns that the Fed is just reacting to, to a bunch of stuff. So again, vast literature on that. The question then becomes, when you're looking to relate monetary policy shocks to quarterly investment data, how, how do you sum up? Because right? there's two FOMC meetings in every quarter, and some of the details in the paper, you know, we have two different ways. To, to, to sum up. So you'll see a bunch of different columns in some of the tables, you know, uh, equal weighted versus value weighted, something like that. Those are just two different ways to aggregate up high frequency identification of U.S. monetary policy shocks into a quarterly number that we can throw into a regression. So, so don't be confused uh, by any of that as I, as I go through this. Um, sample period begins in 2002. Like I say, the, the action was really 2014. Um, you know, do standard things like dropping financial firms, uh, utilities firms. Uh, we Windsorized the sample, etc. Again, not, not to bore you with too many details here. Again, our main in the first establishing the first result, the main variable of interest is this physical investment. Uh, 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 series, uh, capital expenditures over uh, total assets. Uh, have a whole bunch of controls, of course, in, in the regression, standard things in the investment literature, size of the firm, Tobin's Q, cash flow, sales growth, all very, very standard from the investment literature. Nice uh, distribution of industries to, to look at. Um, Connected firms, so looking at some summary statistics, you look at the, go ahead and just look at the bottom table. Connected firms tend to be a little bit bigger than unconnected firms. One of the things that you need to do in this literature, in this type of study, is to, you know, validate what's known as a parallel trends assumption, and I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in, in, in just a minute. But the, the point is that you know, you, you, if, if you're trying to identify and estimate the effects of a particular event, like the Connect, uh, in your sample, it can't, you don't want it to be the case that even before the event, these 
diff these two types of firms were trending in different directions. You need to verify that those firms were kind of trending pre-event in the same direction. So there's a little bit of information here and more in the, in the regression uh, uh, model that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually skip over, looking at how these firms, connected firms and unconnected firms, are different from one another. You know, they're, they're not vastly different, especially with the Shanghai Connect. The, the connected firms are a little bit bigger than the unconnected firms. Um, I think there was a little bit more of a tendency with the Shenzhen Connect to look at, uh, to include growth stocks, right? The, the Shenzhen is sort of the Silicon Valley of, uh, of, of China. You guys probably know better than I do. Uh, but in any case, not dramatically different uh, to connected and, and unconnected firms. Okay, so here's the main table, the kind of the baseline set of results. Just go through it and show you, looking at the, so the, you know, columns four through nine, let's look at those first. And again, four through six and seven through nine, that's just the, the difference between how we aggregate up the high frequency US monetary policy shocks, value weighted versus equal weighted. Results are robust, so we, we kind of drop carrying around these, uh, these redundant columns in later tables. But you want to look at that second row, the interaction term, that so-called beta 3, is negative and significant no matter what you know, types of fixed effects we include in the regression, um, how we weight up the US monetary policy shock. And that's, that's our main hypothesis. That, that's a validation of our main hypothesis that uh, firms' investment expenditures are more sensitive to U.S. monetary policy shocks. Again, contractionary U.S. monetary policy lowers Chinese firm investment and made more sen and, and differentially depending on whether the firm is in the connect or not. You can see from the third row the coefficient on uh, the monetary policy shock itself that that also just has a negative effect overall. So contractionary U.S. monetary policy shocks spill over negatively to Chinese firm investment. And that's the whole Helene Ray global financial cycles type of finding. Okay? And of course, they're doing that on a, on a much broader sample of countries. But notice also from the first three columns a preview of what we're going to find in part two of the paper, right? That there are, you know, there, there are positive benefits if we just look at the coefficient on the connect dummy alone, <laughs> firms' investment expenditures, uh, you know, connected firms' investment expenditures are higher than unconnected firms' investment expenditures. So that, like, like, I, get, like I said, that, that's kind of going to be a preview of what we're going to find in, in part two of the paper, the so-called part two. Okay. Um, Here's the idea behind the parallel trends assumption that I was kind of stammering uh, out prematurely, as it were. You know, you can, you can look either at the, uh, re the uh, regression coefficients here. We just have these interaction dummies between the connect lagged a certain number of quarters or led a certain number of quarters, one through three plus, or minus one through minus three, uh, that interaction on the U.S. monetary policy shocks, you can see either from the graph or the table that there was no difference prior to inclusion in the connect, no difference in the sensitivity of firms' investment expenditures to U.S. monetary policy shocks prior to the connect. No, no differential effect depending on whether this firm would ultimately be in, in the connect or not. So this alleviates a whole bunch of endogeneity concerns that we need to worry about. Some more details, some more, lots of robustness, lots of robustness checks here. Uh, alternative measure of monetary policy surprise, that, that R, upper right column, that R in the alternative, that's me again, in the uh, alternative measure of monetary policy surprises. Uh, you know, a whole bunch of different robustness checks here, different measures of external shocks. Is this, is this just really uh, you know, equity market volatility? Is it really just a VIX shock? You know, uh, no, 
it's 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 not really that that does include including the VIX uh, uh, interacted with the connect dummy does nothing to take away from the spillover effects from U.S. monetary policy shocks. Uh, maybe it's a, a global economic policy uncertainty, so lower right panel there. No, we can interact that global economic policy uncertainty. It's the IMF guys index. Uh, no, you know, it, it's not that. There, there really does seem to be something about U.S. monetary policy shocks spilling over and affecting Chinese firm level investment. And again, differentially for firms included in the Connect and, and not included in the Connect. Some placebo tests, is this really just Chinese monetary policy? You know, through the fixing of the RMB to the U.S. dollar, maybe Chinese monetary policy is, uh, you know, inheriting much of U.S. monetary policy, right, like Hong Kong. Hong Kong monetary policy is U.S. monetary policy. Not, not that either. It's not, this doesn't have anything to do with the monetary policy shock in China. So let me just get to, uh, let me get to uh, part two of the paper, uh, hypothesis three. Is being in the connect a bad thing? No. Right? So, th so that's not what the paper I is about. Okay? There are these spillover effects. But you know, how are these firms responding? It seems like they are responding in ways that are healthy, uh, if you will. And again, if being in the connect were a bad thing, presumably firms would lobby to, to stay out of it. Uh, so we're going to document, I've already mentioned them a couple of times already, we're going to document those positive effects of the connect on connected Chinese firms. But you know, kind of end the paper you know, getting back to policy implications, just because being in the connect is not a bad thing doesn't lead to the conclusion that being more sensitive to global shocks, like U.S. monetary policy shocks, you know, that quite possibly might be a bad thing. It, it does take away some of the independence of Chinese monetary policy. We think of uh, episodes like the taper tantrum and how that affected uh, emerging market economies. So, you know, presumably, Chinese firms, you know, connected Chinese firms are doing something to, um, you know, offset this increased sensitivity to global shocks. And what we find is that they're raising more cash, for example, uh, mixing things up. I just have a couple minutes left here. But here's one of the positive effects of being the connect. This is a simple event study looking at abnormal returns around the announcement day for the, the, the typical firm the announcement of being included in the Connect, so you can see that very uh, s uh, significantly positive effect on, on returns. Uh, ROA, return on assets, just looking across columns here. Return on equity, cost of debt is lower. Uh, you know, return on uh, assets, return on equity is higher. Um, and part of this, uh, hedging type of story that we want to tell. Connected firms are raising more cash in response to U.S. monetary policy shocks compared to unconnected firms. You can see that from the positive and significant coefficients in row, row two there. So, so, so that's it. Uh, I think I've said everything already. Uh, some increased spillover effects from global shocks, uh, an important one, and, and, and we, we like the identification, careful identification of U.S. monetary policy shocks. So that, that identification is very clean, and this, this robust seems to be, this result seems to be very robust. It's just one of those, it, it, just, it just doesn't go away. Uh, and lots of those tables were, were showing that. There's some firm level heterogeneity in responses that seem to be consistent with the finance, financial channel, so sort of more weakly positioned, you know, weak in the financial sense. Chinese firms are more, even more sensitive to these external shocks than those in a stronger financial position. But there are a bunch of uh, positive effects of the Connect too, and we tie this to these uh, kind of important uh, policy issues. Okay, thank you, Chao, um, for invite for including me in this conference. 
uh, we're really going to shift gear here. Uh, what I'm going to present is a very macro paper. Um, the, my co-authors are Mike Dotsey from also from the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia, and Fen Yen. <laughs> And the disclaimer, you forgot. <laughs> oh, it was on the, oh, mine. Yeah, we have to say that the views represented here are, not, are those of our own, and they're not of the reserve banks or the reserve system. All right, let me start with some very familiar empirical facts that motivated this paper. The first is that the Chinese economy has been growing very rapidly, so we're kind of taking a long, long view now of the last few years, but more like last two decades. So basically, you know, the three facts first is that the Chinese economy has been growing rapidly. And here we'll focus on the per capita GDP. And if you look at, uh, you know, the absolute growth rates or the relative growth, the, the, the growth rates relative to that of the, not the growth rate, the level relative to that of the US, they've been churning up really fast. The second is the, you know, the age of the Chinese population due to low fertility rates, as well as, among other things, increased life expectancy. Um, the third is structural changes. We're quite familiar by now of those positive structural changes, meaning that the privatization of state firms. But what's been happening <laughs> since the mid-2000s that's beginning to receive some attention is what we call the financial regression, or the government have a subsidy of you know firms in the capital intensive sectors and more of those for more of the firms in those sectors are state owned so what we do in this paper is to really bring all these these elements together and have a have a model which we link both households and firms in two ways one is the usual you know saving and investment the other is the labor both along the quantity as well as the quality. Quantity meaning how many people are available to work. The quality means the, you know, we're going to in, introduce, uh, we're going to endogenize human capital investment. Then we're going to take this model to do sort of a growth accounting exercise. We'll ask, you know, how much of each channel contribute to what we observe. And two statistics, we're going to pay special attention. One is this per capita output growth, and the other would be the household savings rate. Just a quick summary of the model. It's an it's a overlapping generation model. People entering the economy at a certain age. They work, they save, they consume, and they die for sure by a certain age. The family members are connected through inter vivo transfers as well as human capital investment. <coughs> So what we mean here is that, you know, the, when the parents age, the kids will provide for them. And the human capital investment decisions are made by the parents. They decide how much, you know, for a lot of us, not me, a lot of the young Chinese are here, you know how much you're spending, your parents' money. So that's the part that, uh, you know, the, they're deciding how much to invest there on their kids' human capital. And the production, we're going to uh, model it as two sectors. One is the capital intensive sector. The other is the labor intensive sector. The reasons we do that is, is again, try to capture the credit policies that have been changing over the last two decades. And um, finally, you know, we need a government sector that's going to, you know, going to finance these subsidies and also they're going to finance the, the pension system in the in, in China. Just a quick preview of the results. Um, so this is a large literature, right? So wh where do we stand compared to in terms of results? So we're going to show that this interaction of the demographic and, and you know, credit policy on the firm side are really important in the sense that the demographic changes has important implications when you look at per capita. It actually tr it's actually driving some of the, you know, the, the movements in the per capita output growth rates. And then the credit mark frictions, as you can imagine, it affects the, directly the, the capital demand, right? So it's also going to have implications for household savings. Uh, we're going to conduct an experiment of this new fertility policy that started being implemented in 2015. If, you know, essentially, families now can have more than just one child. Uh, let me quickly review the literature. So there's a huge literature on the fast growth in China. Uh, we, are the, we contribute to this literature really by adding the more recent government policies which aim at promoting you know, the more of the state-owned firms and also firms in the capital-intensive sector. And the empirical work are best 
along on that particular subject is best sub summarized by uh, a couple of papers by Ta Zhao and his co-authors. And then we also relate to the high savings literature in China, and that literature has mostly focused on you know the household side. We're going to abstract away from that you know the, the focus on the sort of the risk has increased. I mean that's being extensively studied, and our contribution really is to incorporate the endogenous human capital investment and also try to make touch with the the firm side policy changes. And finally, we also are related to these capital market policies and Chinese current account. And however, we do not, we, we have a close economy, general equity model. And our defense is really, I mean, if you look at the current account balances as a percent of GDP, it's really been mostly you know, around two, three, four percent, uh, except during the Great Recession where China implemented that huge fiscal expansion policy, right? Um, and also, more importantly, if you look at uh, savings rate and the investment rates over time, they kind of follow similar patterns. So another way of putting it is that we could, you know, include that, have a, have an open, like capital accounts in the economy, but we would be doing it as some of the literature that's out there is more of a level effect than you know, some interesting dynamics going on. So for that reason, we're just going to say we're going to do general equilibrium. <laughs> Um, so demographics, I kind of mentioned it already. We're going to have a household, a representative household. They're going to enter the economy at age 23. They're going to have all their children at age 25, just for simplicity. They retire at age 55. That's because we're trying to target, you know, our initial steady state is the late 70s. And, and it is shocking how much, I'll show you how much life expectancy have increased since then. And the earnings, um, that's sort of very standard in the macro literature, you're going to have age-dependent labor efficiency units. But we add to that by modeling a human capital. And the two of them will impact how much your labor, you know, your labor produ productivity. Another way of seeing it, even though we don't model the labor supply itself endogenously, because of the population changing, because of the, you know, the human capital changing, over time, which is endogenous, we will have you know, labor sort of supply changing endogenously. Um, we're going to have a pension that's a fraction of your earnings right before retirement. And then your labor, your income, depending on whether you're retired or not, going to be subject to different tax rates, meaning that your labor income tax will be, your labor income will be taxed to support the pension, and your labor as well as capital income will be taxed to support the credit policies. And for fertility, you know, it's, it's super hard to model family, kids, endogenously. So for our purpose, we're going to take that as, as given. So basically, we say at age 25, you're going to have a blah number of kids. And it's actually going to be a fraction, because our household is, is like a one-member household. Um, so, the, so then we also model this transfer. So they're all going to be motivated by micro studies behind, which I'm not going to uh, elaborate too much. So the transfer the parents receive, where well, we assume it's after retirement, and also the amount they receive depends, depends on their children's income and also depending on how many kids they have. Um, you know, con consumption savings will be endogenous. Children's expenditure, the living expenditure, and also the mandatory education expenditure, we assume the first, ten, first nine years are mandatory. You know, education is mandatory. That that corresponds to elementary as well as junior high school. And after that, you know, the education expenditure would be endogenous. That include high school as well as you know, uh, and college. For final output is an aggregation of the capital intensive product, the intermediate goods as well as the labor intensive. So this part we follow and tell Jazz um, Brookings paper very closely. And there's a relative price that governs the, you know, that applies to two different goods. And this would be the equilibrium conditions if you do the, you know, the profit maximization problem. Again, to, to address the, the Chinese sort of capital markets or the financial market in general, you, one has to pay attention to the sort of the 
the wedge, what we call the wedge between the deposit rate that households receive and the marginal productivity of capital. You know, the average households, you don't receive the amount that, the, there's, there's a basically a lot of frictions which we're just gonna be, we're not gonna model the, the micro foundation. Instead, we say there's a, there's a wedge, and that's sort of most of the macro literature have been doing, and we let the wedge slowly declining over time. That's kind of capturing the, the development of the financial markets, or one element of the, the opening of the financial markets in, 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 in the Chinese economy. And on the labor intensive, so on the capital intensive sector, you, we have a Cobb Douglas utility function. It's basically, since mo more of those firms in that sector are state owned so far, I mean, this kind of state versus private is really the, the lines becoming very blurry these days. And in our view, you know, whoever <coughs> receives a lot of subsidies from the government, we would consider them as state owned firms. And these days, our data pretty much stopped at 2012, 2013, 14. These days, it's becoming even more blurrier as the parties are going to sending their members to all the private states. So that's sort of our, you know, our kind of definition. For the labor intensive sector, we're trying to capture the 80s, you know, the opening, the, the privatization of the state firms. So there, we would like the private firms and state firms to coexist. Therefore, you need you, either you, you assume some kind of really large elasticity of substitution, or as we did here, we say there's a decreasing return to scale technology. So that would allow firms of different productivity to coexist. But then we don't want to deal with who gets the profits, right? I mean, you could say they're, pro, you know, they're bidding back to the households. Another way of doing it is just to have some fixed cost that absorbs all the profits that's in the economy. So that's what we do here. We have you know, decreased return to scale as a, as a technology, but we also introduce fixed costs that takes away the, the, the profits. Oh, something, looks like something is missing. So there's a old age social security system. Again, that's capturing the, you know, the 80s, the 70s system where everybody works for the state firms. It's like the GGM here, right? You get a very generous pension as, as a, in return, but as part of the reform, that pension is going to be slowly reduced. Um, so for the credit policy, yeah, this, I have to apologize. I don't know if the things look kind of weird there. All right, so for the, so for the, the, the policies, we proxy it with credit policies. That's really like, a, you know, like, a, it's really capturing a lot of things. I mean, you know, kind of policies that's in China that, that's been implemented by the government. The supporting evidence are really, if you look at bank loans, right, or the rates that the firms receive. I think Daniel's, uh, some of your data, and they're also, some of the other data, like by William Tone and also Yen Bai and their co-authors, and they would indicate they, they have sort of more micro manufacturing le le level firms data. They would show you, look, large and state-owned firms would have lower interest rate, lower borrowing rates from the banks. And if you also look at bank loans to, you know, to these different firms, so these are the supporting evidence behind why we capture these policies by having a credit policy. So effectively, we're saying that you know, the state firms will face a lower borrowing constraint, borrowing rates, and they're also later on, the capital firms in the capital intensive sector will also face lower interest rates, borrowing rates. So that's the way we capture these taxes. Okay, so we're gonna have calibration, and so the calibration in these kind of big macro models usually to two stages. The first stage are parameters that we're very comfortable with. We, not just our, our three co-authors, but the literature, such as you know the risk aversion parameter, and then there's some others like the you know the the, the at what age you have like you know these are exogenous too, right? Like things you could easily pin down from the data. So we do that first stage, and then the second stage, particularly think about the credit policies, right? So we have to estimate them assuming logistic functions to fit whatever data we have, and then extrapolate <coughs> to the future. Because this is, this is kind of analysis, you start from initial steady state and then you feed in on the household side, it would be these kind of shocks. And on the firm side, it would be government policies. And then you simulate and you also assume a final steady state. In this case, it would be, for our benchmark, it would be you know, the fertility, the one-child policy goes 
you know, continues to the final steady state, but all the credit policy will go away. That's sort of ideal, you know, like there's no more government intervention. Um, but the, the, the okay, and, and the pension replacement rate will be down from 45% to 20%. So effectively, we have uh, the initial steady state is calibrated to the data. Uh, the final steady state is calibrated under these assumptions, which is sort of an ideal economy, no, no these distortions. Some of the policies we assume will stay. And then in between, what we do is you have these processes. You try to fit the dynamics we have up to 2014. And then you let it run, knowing that you have to converge you know, within 100 years or so to the final steady state. So that's kind of the, uh, the exercise behind what I'm going to do, I'm going to present. So this is what I mentioned by the financial development. There is a, there is a, a shrink in this wedge between margin, uh, margin productivity of capital as well as the deposit rate that households face. And again, the deposit rate is really capturing a lot of different channels, not just the banking. If I put a deposit with the banks, how much I get. And that's like never change, right? You look at that series. So, so I was thinking when I look at this, you know, the earlier papers, beautiful micro data, a huge amount of effort. The interesting about macro data is the other things. You can get these data fairly easily, but making them, putting them together so they all fit, that's the challenge. In the sense that some of the numbers, um, yeah, I mean like, the, you know, for example, the state owned versus private, depending on where you get the data, it kind of, the definition is getting kind of fuzzy. So that's where we struggle. So, so this is the, you know, the, the subsidy. Basically, this is saying that initially we don't have any private firms, right? And we kind of implement that by saying that there's a huge, huge tax on, on your borrowing. To the extent that in, the, in 1978, around that time, our initial study said there was hardly any private firms. And later on, we take away that tax. So negative means tax that goes by the right axis. And this is capturing the, you know, the, so this is all like indirect. We try to match the capital out. Maybe I should just go straight to the to the charts. So we're trying to match, you know, like the the cap K sector means capital intensive, L means labor intensive. We do have data on the relative output share, relative relative capital. We also have employment, private versus you know, state versus private. And just to mention that we count the collective firms as state. And so that's sort of what we use this data to to back out our the, the three subsidy series I showed you just now. Um, let me speed up a little bit. So these are the two series we're most interested in, right? The savings rate and the per capita growth rate. And we kind of do a fairly decent job here. And that zigzag is because of the you know, life expectancy. You can only increase one year at a time. So you e introduce discreteness in the simulation. So the benchmark, you know, obviously we do let me probably just skip that. I mean, the benchmark really, we're kind of, for the top two, really, it's just these two. And then we want to show you a bit more, you know, statistic and to see how reasonable they are. But let me, s s let me see if this works. So now we're going to, the next, ex the next bunch of exercise we do is to, you know, to turn on one channel at a time to kind of show you, I mean, our basic messages are really, you know, the household side and firm side, they all matter. But they, mo they matter at different horizon and also with different intensity. Let me try to see. Yeah, that, that doesn't work. So you're gonna just have to take me for my words. Oops, I don't know what happened. So I was trying to do fancy where you click one of the things and things will automatically pop up. It's not working here. Oh yeah, no, one important thing is about this, uh, you know, this endogenous. All right, so I'm screwing up things, okay.
Okay, so let's take a, just this is further validation of our data. These are the moments we did not target, right? So we capture the aging of the population really well. This is the Leon dependency ratio. This is the growth rate of wage. So the wage is actually weekly increasing over time. And in terms of the marginal product to capital over time, and it's, in our model it's clearly declining. In the data it's, it's also declining up to the time that we have, we have the data. Um, just kind of because endogenous human capital is also very important for our analysis. And what we capture is really the, we don't, you know, the private spending on education is, is we don't really have data, it's also very minimal in the, 19, in the late 1970s. But later on, there are some household surveys available in 2002 in particular, where the parents, you know, report what fraction of their income they spend on education. And that's what we use to, yeah. Um, this is all messed up. All right, so let me just. Okay, sorry. Okay, so let's go back to this chart. Um, I can't show you the table, so I'm just gonna tell you one thing at a time, and none of them will come so su too surprising to you. So, f but putting them. T um, it does involve a lot of effort to, to, you know, to compute these, these analysis. So for, first, first of all, let's think about household size. So on the demographic changes, what we find is the life expectancy changes has the biggest impact in terms of your savings behavior. And the fertility is important, but it starts kicking in much later. And it also matters directly, of course, for mechanical reasons for the computation of the per capita GDP calculation, right? early on, and later on, it takes a while for the human endogenous human capital. Because of the transfer payment in the past, when, pa when the parents decide how much to invest in the human capital, they're really making the decision of, I could either have you know, more kids, or I could invest in their human capital, right? If I have more kids, then you know, they will provide for my old time, because the, the amount of transfer payment I get is possibly correlated with kids. Fine, okay. And if I in invest in, in human capital, then, you know, of course, I could also through my own private savings to provide for my own, you know, old age expenditure, right? So what happens is when you have the fertility rates change, if you don't model the endogenous human capital, you're going to have a huge boost to the, to the savings, right? Because now you have just one kid that can provide for you. But, you know, you have this long life that you need to live. So that's going to have a huge impact on savings. But if you introduce endogenous human capital, that's going to take away some of the positive impact coming from the reduced fertility rates. But that's going to have contribute very positively on the, on the output growth. So that's one interaction we want to emphasize. On the firm side, think about all these policies, right? They are all like become effective right away. So their impact on savings, for example, because the initial, you know, the first structural change is really improving the productiv productivity in the labor intensive sector, right? So there are implications for wages and interest rates are instantaneous. So they actually have impact on the household savings right away. So the message really here is the household side, yes, there are so many these big changes that's got a lot of attention, but their impact really comes in much later. It takes, you know, 15 years for the kids to grow, right? But for the firm side, all these policies are instantaneous. You see the effects even on households right away. And more importantly, think about uh, more recent, starting from the 2000, mid-2000s, mid all these policies that are promoting the capital intensive industries, right? So under our setup, they're actually not good for growth. So they actually subtract the growth. However, because they raise the capital demand, they contribute to the savings. <coughs> So what we're showing you here is really when you look at these two things, you can't just say I'm looking at household side, all the changes to capture the, you know, the savings behavior. I'm going to look at the firm side change to try to capture the, the output growth, the per capita. And our message is really you need to look at both. They really interact in a very interesting way. But to make that point, you need to model and dodge human capital seriously. You also need to take into account not, the, not just the early stage of structural change, but also the later stage, which is to promote the promotion of the capital intensive sector. Okay, so that's the, unfortunately I can't see, show you the charts. So that's the basic message. And then we also did the, this new fertility rate rise since 2005. Uh, we're being somewhat optimistic, saying that the, you know, the fertility rate is going to recover. But 
it's not going to go back to, you know, to the 1.8 level. Let's say it goes back to 1.2. So what's going to happen is that total output is going to grow. That's for sure. But the per capita output in our experiments, you know, it's not going to. So this is the this is the benchmark, right? So the per capita output is actually going to actually going to be you know be lower than what it if we let the fertility the new the, if if we don't implement the new fertility policy. Again, this is you know part of it is coming from the mechanics, right? The population is growing. Do output grow? Does output grow fast enough to compensate for that? And again, so it depends on lo whether you look at total output or if you look at per capita output. All right, so just to, just to wrap up, so our takeaway really is to look at the Chinese tremen tremendous growth in output in savings rate of the last two decades. And there are both firm si household side and firm side developments that we need to bring together. And also looking forward, you know, some of these policies, their impact are, are perhaps not as large as, you know, the government had hoped for. And so hopefully this is the, we provide a framework that would allow for future additional analysis. I want to say that I feel really sorry for the malfunctions of SNIDES and I feel Dr. Wanini has set a great example of carrying on despite <laughs> unexpected circumstances. So now I'm going to take a few questions. Yeah, could Hi, you identify uh, yourself? And yeah, uh, I'm Robert Bloom. I'm an economist. Uh, actually, I just came over from the IMF annual research conference, unfortunately scheduled at the same time as this <laughs> conference. So, um, I want to bring, a, uh, I want to ask about the migrate, mi you know, the migration from rural to urban, which is considered also a big driver of uh, economic growth, not just population growth. So that's also maturing in China. Maybe. <clears throat> you know, in the U.S., the agri rural sector may be 5% of GDP, but uh, in China, maybe it would be 20%. Uh, maybe that's the equilibrium point. And it's fast approaching that. Plus, there's unofficial migration and so on from, you know, undocumented, non huko migration. There was an economist uh, named Alwyn Young who was right. at LSE. He's a demographer. <clears throat> and back in the later 90s, actually, he sort of predicted the Asia financial crisis uh, in 97 when he said that uh, the tiger economies were overestimating economic growth because the super growth was based not just on population growth but also on migration from rural to urban. And he said by <clears throat> maybe a year or two before the Asia financial crisis, uh, that growth was over. And uh, although the governments were still overestimating growth, and he said those countries have basically reached normal, a normal industrial economy's population growth. So my question is, are you taking into account, or and how are you taking into account implicitly this decline in migration from rural to urban, which is also a big driver of population growth? Okay, we are taking a, a couple other questions. So because you know it's close to lunch time, so can I make the questions be short? Yeah. yeah two questions. Uh, uh, U.S. Uh, monetary policy affects the currency, but the currency can be independent of the U.S. monetary policy. So I was wondering how you separate the monetary policy from the currency declines or, you know, into the, into the connect. And the second question is, uh, uh, the Chinese social security system, I think, is a pay-as-you-go system, similar to the U.S., but really it amounts to uh, a national pension policy because the people who are paying today really finance the retirees. And since China has such good control over their economy, I can't understand are they thinking of going to a national uh, pension plan? Because that's what it amounts to right now. Thank you. The um, question in the bank. Thank you. I'm Jinning Nguyen with Voice of Vietnamese Americans. Would you also take into the account of the migrations, uh, the sending uh, workers, 
to other countries, in the example of Vietnam, Sri Lanka, and Africa, to do projects. Uh, those people, are they in calculation in, uh, your pre in the presentations? And how would they affect the Chinese economy and the uh, population in China? So actually, let me add my two questions, a little bit of using my power. So I have a question for Zhang. The, so when you look at the capital investment, do you separate the equipment investment, structure investment, and uh, or inventory investment? And uh, for question for Wenin, my question is, um, how does housing industry feature in your model? Are they capital intensive firms or labor intensive firms? Or, you know, given that after 1970s, we observe the rise in housing prices and uh, the impact on saving rates, where does it show up in your model? Or, yeah, what are the implications? So I guess maybe Jiang would first answer question, just a funnel the water. Oh, great. Yeah. Uh, th thanks for the two questions. So, so no, we, we, we don't, but that might be an interesting, uh, ro another robustness check to uh, correct, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I, I believe we don't, but don't correct me here if I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, excellent question on the exchange rate and in, in one of the many robustness checks tables that I rushed through, we, we, we look at that channel directly. And, it, and it, it, that, that seems not to be what's going on. So, so it is separately from the exchange rate effects of U.S. monetary policy shocks uh, that this, this transmission is going on. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, no, thank you for all the great questions. So this migration from rural to you know, countryside to the city, that's been a huge topic that's been really heavily studied. You know, they're responsible for the growth, early growth in Chinese economy. The housing price, I mean, basically everything. You know, every time the government has a particularly important meeting, you know, what's going to happen in Beijing? These people are going to be, you know, asked to leave. So, so because for that reason, so we didn't focus on that by having like an agriculture sector. So rather in our model, because we want to do this big picture. So we kind of, oh, we not kind of, we, add, we include them in this so-called light, light, capital light industries. So, you know, in a way that uh, migration is really showing up in from the, you know, the state, what I call state firms to the light, you know, to the more productive private firms. So in our calibration, that's how we capture that. But obviously, it's missing all the new nuances. But I think we kind of capture the gist of it, which is these people, you are, you are having more people moving into the more productive labor intensive firms. And the second question about pension. Um, the way I see it, if you look at employment, you know, the share of people working for private firms, that's really increasing a lot. And these people do not have, uh, correct me, on the spot if anyone knows this better than I do. Um, I, my impression is these people don't have provided pension by government. But the people who, like my parents' generation who have a pension, the government is much less than before. So that is, I don't know if there's a, plan of, of any nationalization of this pension, not to my knowledge. I don't think so, but again, you know, whoever knows more on this topic, please, please correct me right now. Um, yeah, the question about the, you know, the, are you talking about the people going to Vietnam to work or the workers from Vietnam coming to China? The people who go to Vietnam, because there are many, many of them. Yeah. In you know, Vietnam, there's a hundred thousand of them. And yeah, I think, I think the. Only one, two, three, yeah. Many others uh, that I assume that. I think that in. in the yeah. one belt, one road, they have many projects everywhere. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's an excellent point. I think the interesting thing is that wherever Chinese go, you always think there are so many of them. But if you divide by the Chinese population, <laughs> it's just really small. I guess what I'm trying to say is that if I take those workers and div it, in, in the grand scheme of things, it probably, my guess is it doesn't matter for what I'm doing here because it's still a very small fraction. But if I study Vietnamese economy, I would definitely take that into consideration because it's, it's, it's huge, right, relative to the domestic Vietnamese population. So for, yeah, so we don't, we, did not take into that, take that into consideration. And I think the, you asked about housing. Yeah. So this we go with the, you know, Tao Zhang. He has wonderful, this 
macro aggregate data that he's made available, and he said the St. Louis Fed. So they did all the classification depending on the labor income share. So housing, real estate is classified as heavy industry. I mean, I guess it sort of makes sense. You need capital intensive. Capital intensive. So we, we subsidy. We definitely, yeah. Okay. So that's actually one. Of, so one thing that we didn't talk about, but if you look at the peak of our subsidies, it, it is in 2010, but by no means we captured that huge fiscal expansion in China, right, 2009 and 2010. And if you look at where the money was spent, it was real estate and the capital intensive, those big machinery industries. And there are a lot of papers on that already, like just focus on those two years. And we kind of capture that by capturing the relative output share, but we don't, so they are kind of all in capital intensive sector, but we don't model them separately. Yeah. Please join me in a round of applause for the insight of our speaker.